hello and Merry Christmas. I realize most of you won't be listening to this on Christmas Day. However, if you are, welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness Wednesday, which happens to fall on Christmas. This was pre-recorded, of course, but I saved this episode one of the last of the year, and especially for Christmas Day, because I think of the sacred nature of gift giving. I can't think of anything higher, more holy than giving yourself the ultimate gift of inner connection, accessing your inner body wisdom, connecting into the divine, to God, however you define that, to Christ for many people, and especially this is a Christian holiday. When you connect in, when you give yourself the space and time in your private chambers especially to come into yourself you then are able to move into the rest of your life in a manner that's beautiful purposeful flowing nourishing life-giving to others this episode is actually really special to me because jasmine Patton is my personal mentor she works with me once a month i've been going through her mystery school not jasmine's mystery school but the name of it is called her mystery school it's based out of southern oregon so really beautiful teachings and Jasmine is aligned as a mentor in her mystery school. So she is what she calls a spirited business coach and she works with creative entrepreneurs like myself and probably many of you. She teaches ways and systems for you to align with grace and ease versus stress, exhaustion and burnout. So it's really easy to get kind of enmeshed in people that we love and care about, maybe not necessarily a spouse or a romantic partner, our children, those anywhere in our sphere of influence. And so she has some great tips and gems of wisdom herself in how to navigate that and to create a space in your life to let that flow. Now, if any of you have heard me talk about the Stand Speak Shine School, I'm really, really excited about that coming up um, in 2020, at the end of January 2020. So go to standspeakshine.com for more information. Also, uh, many of you have accessed my free mini healing kit on my website, and you can find it at shereeburton.com forward slash healing kit, or you can just go to my website, shereeburton.com, and it'll pop right up. I'm bringing that up because it's free. It's downloadable instantly, and you can access some of these beautiful sensory tools to be able to get into your knowing, into yourself through some very simple means. So Jasmine and I, we really developed this conversation even further. I loved how we were able to get deep into the heart of sort of our deepest fears and why we sabotage and avoid this highest and holiest practice of self-nourishment. Well, Jasmine, it's a joy to have you today. I am never, I'm never shocked. I shouldn't ever actually be shocked who the universe puts in my path as a mentor. And you happen to be my mentor, right? One of my mentors went in a big way right now through her mystery school and your private mentorship in the self-care. What is it actually called? Devotional self-care? Yeah devotional self-care and uh, mm-hmm. just so y'all listeners know um i met, i interviewed jamana sophia on this program through a mutual friend that connected us and was so taken in with her messaging around feminine sovereignty and the need for connecting in and all of this all of the beautiful teachings that are contained within femininity for Uh, the way that she embodies that and the way she brings it forward with her eloquence. And Jasmine is on, is one of her teachers and one of the mentors that she has in her tribe that runs her mystery school and um, shares her mentorship because you've been through all of that, right? You've, (laughs) you've been through all of her training and you've you've also niched into your own domains with, I think it, isn't it spiritual, um, business, spirited business, spirited business, Mm -hmm. which I love. And then the devotional self-care. So for everyone listening who would see your beautiful face and see what you're offering now and how you've stepped into the space of wisdom, and I'm sure it was hard earned. (laughs) So I always like to start with what brought you here? What have you walked through that has given you this level of this dimension of wisdom and expertise in self-care? Hmm. Great question. Uh, yeah, just some firewalks and <laughs> trials and tribulations. <laughs> um, 
let's see, I'll start with, you know, at, in the beginning of my life and up till maybe five years ago or so, I've, I've been very sensitive and empathic, but I didn't know it for a long time. And I think because I didn't know it in a way, I had a lot of insecurity, just being kind of a shy woman and a sensitive woman. It, it often led me to be more of, uh, more in a withdrawn and protective kind of space, which wasn't actually very empowering. So I've, I've spent a lot of my life understanding what it feels like to be insecure, to be self-critical, to not really have a strong sense of, of who I am when I'm around other people. So that's just kind of the broad stroke of, of where I came from. About five years ago, I ended a relationship that I'd been in for a couple of years. And at that point, I was in my early 40s and I had spent, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years previous to that really realizing that I wanted to have a child, I wanted to have a long-term committed relationship, and I was making choices of the partners that I chose where they didn't actually really want that, or they maybe kind of wanted it, but didn't totally want it. So I found myself in my early 40s at the end of this relationship with the dying dream of being a mother, this uh, unfulfilled longing to have a really beautiful, committed relationship. And I was emotionally exhausted. I was feeling really disconnected from myself, really disheartened about the experience of having these really intense dreams and desires for my life and not seeing them actually fulfilled. Uh, it was a rough place to be. Mm -hmm. Just just exhausted, just over it, just like what is going on with my life, you know, in that sense. My work was going well, my friendships were going well, but this realm of relationship and my, my really deep fulfillment was not going so well. And I remember coming out of that relationship and, and just wondering, like, what do I do now? <laughs> Now that I'm single and in my early 40s and disillusioned, like what next? And what came to me was really simple. It was just this directive to start walking. Just move my body and go for walks. And that somehow that was the only thing that made sense right then was to just go for walks. So there's this beautiful park in town that has a creek in it and it's really safe and really lovely. And I just started walking, just walking, walking. And it really helped to get out of my head, out of that disillusionment and to just get in my body and start reconnecting with my essential self again. And what started to unfold from there was this realization that I needed to really take care of myself. I needed to know who I am right now again and understand how I worked because I had been giving so much of my attention and energy to these relationships that weren't working that I didn't even know at a basic level like uh, how my sleep needed to be or how my food needed to be because I was so in the other person's rhythm. So I began mm. on this really simple yet profound journey of discovering when do I like to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner? I discovered that dinner was usually 6.30 for me, whereas in all my previous relationships, it was 7.30 or later. And what would happen then is I would get low blood sugar, I would get hungry, I would get irritated, anxious, because basically I was denying my own very simple physical needs of eating around 6.30 in order to make this relationship work as far as timing. And I started to discover, oh, I, I like to go to bed, you know, maybe around 1030 and sleep for about eight hours. And it was so simple, but it was so powerful to understand what my rhythms were mm -hmm. outside of what anybody else needed or wanted. And there was something about that that brought me back home to myself helped me trust myself, helped me connect more deeply with myself. 
so this was many, many years of this practice. It actually took quite a while to understand again, like, who am I? What is it that I need? And as I started to really deepen into that, I became more confident. I became more happy. I became more able to engage with people instead of withdrawing and hiding because I was protecting my energy. Mm -hmm. And life just got better. Uh, In the midst of all of that, I discovered that I had a fibroid, well, actually a number of them, but a really quite a large one on the outside of my uterus. Mm -hmm. And being who I am, I decided to take the natural approach and I did acupuncture, I did herbs, I did nutrition, I did meditation, you know, I did exercise, pretty much anything I could think of that would help shrink this thing and keep Western medicine out of my body. And I did that for about maybe nine months or so from when I discovered that I had it. And I went to get checked up again and it had grown a lot. Like this mm-hmm. thing, if, I, if you could see my hands showing you how big it was, you would be shocked. Most of my, my friends, when I show them, are just open mouthed at how large this thing was. Pretty much like three and a half pounds, the size wow. of a six or seven month old child. Oh my gosh. On, yeah. On the outside of my uterus. Um, and so at that point, when I heard how big it was, my doctor basically said, you need to get that thing out. <laughs> and that was really the last thing I wanted to do was to have a surgery, to have Western medicine intervene in my body. Yet it was the only thing actually that would <clears throat> take care of it and make it go away. So I had to make peace with that. And I, I think really that experience was my biggest underworld journey, so to speak, my biggest reckoning with, with who I am and, and with God in a way, um, it was really profound and to, to need to surrender to that, even with all of the self-care that I had done at that point, you know, years and years of it. And so I, I went through the surgery. They, they didn't know if it would be cancerous. They didn't know if they would need to take my other organs at that point, they just basically said, we're going to go in and see. And when you wake up, you'll know what you still have. Wow. Which was really, really huge for me because I, I like my uterus. I like my ovaries. You know, I wanted to keep everything. So there was, there was a huge surrender that I went through to just say, well, it's, it's out of my hands now. And I think one of the biggest lessons I learned through that experience was it's, it's not about whether or not this is happening because it is happening. I can't actually change the fact that this is what's happening. But what I can do is decide how I move through it, how I experience it, and, and in a way, like what mythology do I put around this so that I can make peace with it and find a sense of, of magic and beauty even within that. Right. Uh, which I was able to do, thankfully, you know, down to (laughs) my favorite color is purple. And the nurse on the day of my surgery was wearing this complete purple scrub outfit. (laughs) (laughs) And I was laughing about it. And she says, oh, I never wear this outfit. It was just the only thing that was clean. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought, oh, there's some divine intervention going on here. My nurse is wearing purple. This is perfect. Mm. So I, thankfully I came out of the surgery. All they had to take was this huge fibroid. Everything was clean, clear, and actually pretty miraculous. My surgeon was jumping up and down at how easy and wonderful the experience was. And, um, I made it through and I went back to my self care. It really helped me navigate the healing and and the understanding of how I, th- I think that a lot of the experiences in my life I had internalized, not expressed, and really kept inside of my body. And in a way, I saw that growth as being the encapsulation of, of all that I took in. And I just needed some help to let it go. Mm-hmm. So that has brought me to this place now where I 
I really, I need to speak my truth for my own health. I need to express what I need because I understand that at a level, if I don't do that, the cost is huge for my health, for my well being. So it was a very intense, very difficult experience that just brought me into a deeper connection with myself and uh, understanding the importance of tending to myself, expressing my needs, and really claiming the space that I take up in this world as incredibly important. Did you have any programming when you were growing up that self-care was self-indulgent or not spiritual or... Did you have any of those beliefs circulating that it was in some way selfish to ask yourself, what do I need? What is it I need? You know, what do I like? Did you have any of that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, thankfully, I don't think it really came from my close family. It definitely came from the culture that I grew up in. I, I grew up close to LA. So there was a lot around this image of beauty and how you're supposed to look and what that is all like. And then I really feel like the culture, at least in in the States is very, um, it celebrates when we can deny ourselves Mm -hmm. at at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. There's kind of this heroic vision of, well, I'll, I'll take care of everyone else and everything will be taken care of. And maybe there'll be some left for myself, but kind of doesn't matter at the end of the day. But yeah, growing up as a teenager in Southern California was really rough on self-image. And there, I had an eating disorder for a while um, that thankfully I moved through, but I, I definitely experienced that energy of completely denying my body's essential needs. Mm. in interest of looking a certain way or appearing a certain way to other people. Yeah, I've seen it go both ways where someone, you know, ramps up the self-care, but it's more illusory in terms of its value because they're trying to be people-pleasing with it. Like, you know, um, going out of balance with fitness or health regimes or over shopping. And then I've also seen the absolute neglect where they just you know, they've really detached from how they show up in their being, in their beauty, and they've kind of gone frumpy or or just haven't put the hygiene time in. I mean, I've seen that spectrum and I'm sure you mm-hmm. have too. It's, and I myself has, have vastly, I mean, I've been anywhere along that spectrum at any given time in my life. I think early motherhood was one of the worst times to really find the time for that self-care. But what, what do you think was the bridge between, you know, from, Hey, I have, I see that I maybe have become, and I'm, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but maybe codependent or enmeshed in this other person in the form of a partner. And now that he's not in the picture, um, who am I? And how did you, how did you actually detangle yourself and really, cause I know you're in a healthy relationship now. So what, what was, what were those catalysts that brought you over and bridged you over? I think again, the, the simple act of listening to my body's needs, I think that's a really profound way to rebuild trust with oneself oh, I'm tired. I have two options. One is to just ignore that and stay up and push through. The other is to go to sleep. And I think that there's something really powerful just in that act of acknowledging uh, the true need and tending to that need. And that doing that consistently over time, I mean, we sleep every day, we eat multiple times every day. So there's so many opportunities to rebuild and strengthen the trust inside of ourselves by just paying attention to that. So that, w- that became my practice. What is my need and how can I tend to it? And that's actually and a I very remember spiritual. This- Wouldn't you say that's an extremely spiritual practice? It's like the opposite of selfishness. Yeah. Yeah. And there's this Zen saying that... Uh, 
this this acolyte comes to the Zen master and he says, Zen master, you know, how can I achieve enlightenment? Enlightenment, and he says, Eat when hungry, sleep when tired. <laughs> deep. <laughs> like it's that simple. <laughs> yeah. And I remember buying this book that that was titled something like um how to listen to your inner voice or something like that because I was really at this place where I I knew that I had intuition, I knew that I had inner knowing, but I was so like you said enmeshed and detached from that that I didn't really know how to access that. So I think the the body piece was a really big piece of that because I think that our bodies know way before our minds know they have a wisdom that is deeper and more powerful than just the mind. Mm -hmm. So I started to pay attention to my body at even more subtle levels. So where maybe someone would ask me to go to an event and I would get this uh, knot in my stomach, like, oh gosh, that sounds awful (laughs) to my body. Whereas maybe my mind would be like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. I can connect with people. But then I really started to listen to where my body was saying a very clear no or a very clear yes. And that was my intuition speaking. That was my inner wisdom. And it was really paying attention to my body at that level that also helped me start to detangle from all of that enmeshment and confusion. And it became true. I would, I would listen to my body and just time and time again, it revealed that it was here to take care of me. It was actually here to be for me as opposed to against me. Mm. Um, yeah, so I feel like my my listening to my body for years and years and years and just got like caution to the wind, I'm going to trust it even if it doesn't make sense to my mind, even if it's not actually what I think that I want or if I'm having fear of missing out, FOMO going on, you know, all of that can happen at the same time that my body has a wisdom and I just decided to trust her. Hmm. And she hasn't led me astray so far. Mm. I love that. I I love the idea of just kind of walking through daily life, constantly checking in and accessing that. What what are your ways of doing that? I mean, I I talk to a lot of different people and um, different thought leaders and people are just super passionate about their own work in the world, their own soul callings. And I know this is one of your soul callings to teach this. So I'm super intrigued of what ways you've found that have been most effective to, because you work with a lot of personalities. So it's not just you, right? (laughs) That you're doing Mm -hmm. for yourself. Right. (laughs) what, What have you found has been really key or maybe a first step into accessing that body wisdom? I think the place to start is in what I call the mighty pause. It's being able to just notice first that, that there is, we actually are at choice. You know, I am a sovereign being, I am an independent woman in this world, and I actually have choice as to what to do with my time, my energy, my body. In order to activate that choice, so there has to be a pause between what the world is asking of me and how I choose to respond. Mm. So that pause can be really brief. It can be just a deep breath where I'm able to take a moment to check in It can be uh, a five-minute meditation where I am laying down and I put my hand on my belly, a hand on my heart, and I check in. It can be a longer, you know, weekend where I just need space to just see what's going on. But I think the essence of it is just taking a pause to turn towards myself and simply ask, what is it that I need? What is it that I want here? What will serve me? I, th- I know that in uh, 
with a lot of the women that I work with and with myself too, there is often this feeling that the world comes in with a request and I have to respond right away. Mm -hmm. I some think of very us feel, rarely. Some of us that are more efficient that way have this deep inner responsibility to that. And it's mm -hmm. really hard to detach from that um, tugging at you, <laughs> you know, that tug yeah. to be responsible. Yeah, it is really difficult. And in a way, it's sort of set up that we're expected to just answer right away. Mm -hmm. But I think rarely, only on occasion, is that actually true that you have to respond right now? You know, there's usually not a life and death situation happening. And this is, I think this is where we can take our power back as women to just say, I need five minutes, I need an hour, I need a couple days in order to check in with myself, check in with my reality and see what actually works for me here. So when I work with my clients and this comes from my own personal experience, I say that the tool here is to first notice that you actually are allowed, you have permission to pause. And then you can say to that person or those people, uh, thank you for your request. Let me get back to you in five minutes. Let me get back to you tomorrow. That way they know that you're going to respond. You know that you have time to check in with yourself. And I think that that right there is a really, really powerful tool to just be able to have time to see what actually works for you. And then you can give that answer to the people. Yeah, And I, I did that a lot in that time period when I was learning myself again. Most of the time I either said no or maybe. Very rarely did I say yes. Because honestly, I didn't know how I was going to feel on that day. And because I was putting my body's needs as a priority, I didn't want to say yes to something I might have to then say no to. Mm -hmm. I, because I think we all know how not fun that is to say yes and then have to cancel or change plans. So I would just say, maybe, or no, I don't think that's going to work, but I might change my mind. And that really gave me a lot of latitude to see what actually works for me and mm. not disappoint people in the process. I have found doing that um, the power of no or maybe is great. And I also see it as a teaching moment for those hurried, frenetic types <laughs> who are, you know, I get to say, well, you know, I'm really looking at, uh, I'm really entering a season of self-nourishment because I've seen how um, I say, tend to say yes to everything I get excited about and, and meaningful projects like the one you're talking about or doing this or that. But I really have to be mindful of what I commit to right now. And when you say something along the, the yeah. not as wordy maybe, but when you say something like that, you're, people, you give them the power of pause, right? Where they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> maybe I should do that too. <laughs> exactly. And I, I love that you brought that up because I think that a lot of times in uh, for, just for us as women, like we, we want to please people. We want to take care of people. But I think that we, we often forget that like when I take care of myself, it does, I think at least two things. One, it gives, like you said, permission and inspiration to others to take care of themselves as well. And then oftentimes if I'm really honest with myself that this thing isn't going to work, it's probably not working for that other person or those other people also. I mean, I'm sure we've had this experience where there's an event happening or, or a gathering or something like that. And it's like, oh gosh, actually I can't make it. And then another person says, oh, I can't make it either. And then another person, then pretty soon the event is just not even happening <laughs> because no one really wanted to do it in the first place. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just like a and I've, divine I've, weeding out process. Yeah. And it really comes from, you know, one person having the, the courage to be honest. And that, yeah, I think in a way we're like canaries in a coal mine when we're, we're being really honest and really compassionate. Mm 
and where we're coming from, it can be a voice and a support and an inspiration for others to do the same for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And the best ways we teach, honestly, and I know you know this, is through embodiment. It isn't necessarily what we're saying, but uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's how, it's our essence. It's what our vibration is. It's what our vibe is. It's what people pick up on. It's, it's how our countenance is um, glowing or not, et cetera. Now, when we're talking about um, honoring and nourishing the self and being really, really key, let's talk about the cost. So if, I mean, I'm sure you're like me, like you can pinpoint seasons in your life where you fill out of alignment, even though it's the stuff you teach, right? <laughs> um so, oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what kind of fallout is there? Because I, I know we hear a lot about, oh, take care of yourself, all this, you know, you know, self-care is the key, treat yourself like a queen and all of that. And that is, for some people, it, it doesn't completely land into their heart space or their gut space. They get it intellectually. How... And I, you know, it's not like we want to use scare tactics, like if you don't do this, this will happen. But I think everyone needs the motive, like they, they need the why behind the necessity of it. It's no, like this earth is no longer like a luxury to self-nourish, not that it ever really was, you know, but we're not in, we're not in a survival space in the earth right now, other than it's a spiritual warfare. If we don't it, there's so much polarity happening that if we don't do this, we're kind of toast. So walk us through the fallout that can happen um, when self-nourishment isn't a highest priority. Well, just hearing you ask that question, I, I feel sadness in my heart. So I think that is a very real piece of fallout right there is unfulfilled desires, unfulfilled dreams, unfulfilled soul callings. Also very practically, exhaustion is a really big piece, even up to adrenal exhaustion, uh, which can then create huge fibroids or autoimmune diseases or you know all kinds of health problems. It can also create resentment at the people that you love, disappointment with yourself or with others, you know, because those deep needs are not getting met, being unhappy, uh, just not empty. feeling good. I, I think yeah. the emptiness is one thing I experienced that was when I start to feel emptiness, even though I have a very full life and many things to be grateful for, when I have when I experience feelings of emptiness, I know I'm not I'm not checking in. I'm not getting in there. I'm not nourishing myself at the soul level or the physical level. Um so for me that that's a huge fallout. I meet a lot of successful, mm -hmm. smart, very productive women who have who are completely empty. I meet a lot of very religious women who feel empty. Let's go there for a minute, actually. <laughs> um, okay. Because there's physical nourish nourishment, and then there's emotional nourishment, and then there's spiritual nourishment. I think there's just a, an overwhelm that people feel where they're, they can burn out in the nourishment. Are you following me? Like, it's just more I'm stuff to do. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and that, with, I'm glad you bring that up. Yeah. I see this a lot with women who are on a spiritual path, whether they're on a religious path or just their own spiritual soul sovereignty path. Um, how, do, how do you circumvent that? Well, this is, I think, a, a core piece of how I describe my work and where I'm coming from. I know that, like in pop culture, we talk about self-care and it looks like taking a bath or eating chocolate or hanging out with your girlfriends or whatnot. And a lot of it has to do with doing more things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Putting it on your list, right? And and then that sets us up for mm, disappointment. Like, oh I didn't I didn't take care of myself today, right? I didn't do that thing or I didn't get a massage this month. So I'm not self caring. And 
what I want to bring out is that it's not really about what we do. It's more about where we're coming from. So from my perspective, self-care is not something that we do. It's actually something that we are. And how to work with that from my perspective is being able to ask ourselves the question, what is it that I actually need in any given moment on any given day and getting really honest with that. And then that can open up so many things. And a lot of times it actually looks like doing less, taking things off of our plates, canceling, rescheduling, not saying yes to things that the act of self-care can be taking things off the list as opposed to putting things on. Mm. And it can also, I mean, it can look like so many things on one day. It can look like um, having a piece of chocolate cake because there's something really sensual about that. And there's something really uh, grounding and nourishing just in that. On another day, it might look like around another week or month or stretch of time, it looks like drinking bone broth, for example. Or it could look like having a conversation with somebody to clear the air. It could look like just having some downtime where you're not doing anything. So I think it's really important to take these these things on a list of what self-care can look like and actually just get honest with our own selves, our own deeper needs and see what is needed there. And that I think is a real deep, honest way of tending to ourselves and practicing self-care. Mm. It doesn't matter what anybody else says, what it looks like. It actually matters what it means for you. Yeah, I love that. Taking it's I'm actually reading Kate Northrop's book, Do Less. I don't know if you have heard of her book. Mm-hmm. I haven't read it. She you probably know her. She's Dr. Christian Northrop's daughter. Yeah. Um, who in yeah. Christian is like a huge pioneer, women's bodies, women's wisdom. But this is her daughter, who's now a mother, who runs a, a very successful large business, who is a you know, walking through this whole self-care stuff. Um, and what she learned the hard way. And it's it's actually written very, very compellingly, not your typical self-help book. So I always I've been telling people about like, go read that book, <laughs> do less. Um mm-hmm. so when we're talking about um just you know time out or the mighty pauses you call it which i love and we just it's just a it's just an inquiry process right you just go within and say what is it that i actually need right now why am i feeling mm-hmm. this way what what am i not feeding myself in some way shape or form um i think and and this is something you and i have talked about before when difficult emotions arise um and we don't always have the luxury to do something really amazing for ourselves, like go get a massage or, <laughs> you know, let's just say you, mm-hmm. you're, you, just, you just can't, you're just stuck. You're just physically in an environment where that's not, condu- not going to happen. Um, I know difficult emotions are teachers. So what, what have you found to be key when these difficult emotions arise because it could be in a moment of trauma or crisis and you are stuck there. Um, mm-hmm. how, how do you navigate through that? I, th- I feel like one of the key to that is breath, which also goes along with the pause is you know, when there's difficult emotions, it often, uh, it, it, well, it does live in our bodies. That's just how it works. So if we're able to take a deep breath, like all the way into the belly, not just the chest, but deep into the belly, that can really instantly bring the nervous system down and into a more calm place and out of the head back into the body. I practice this myself a lot. If I'm starting to feel anxious or tense or something's going on, if I just breathe deeply into my belly and really fill that space, it's 
<laughs> foolproof, really. It brings me back down, allows me to be more present and inhabiting my space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So breath is a really key piece of that. And it's so simple. I mean, we can all do it just right now. So just breathing in and allowing that breath to go all the way down to your pelvic bowl and see how much you can fill that space with breath. Mm. That's and then that's it. So simple. Yeah. yeah, it's it's simple. I think where does the resistance really come? Let's just get down to that, you know, because you know, everyone feels inspired to just listen to the body and check in and breathe. And um, I always, when you talked about the bone broth or the chocolate cake, I was like, wow, what a contrast. Um, <laughs> at the same time, we know that one of those, you know, well, everything that we do, the energy with which we do it is what we're experiencing more of. So if, if we're eating the chocolate cake out of shame, we're going to, we're going to eat shame. We're going to experience more shame. If we eat the mm -hmm. chocolate cake out of love and nourishment and joy and sensuality and like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. No shame. I love this. I need this. We're going to metabolize it very differently in our bodies. Right. Um, I mm -hmm. think the same is for anything we're eating, <laughs> whether it's food or experiences we're trying to digest. So mm -hmm. how, where does that resistance, where, what is the root of the resistance outside of what we've kind of been programmed with, but when we're just a normal human woman walking through life with all of these demands and responsibilities, what are the saboteurs that keep us in resistance to doing this on a regular basis, to checking in and so forth? That's a great question. I, I think I have a couple uh, things to share around that. You know, I think one is that it can be terrifying to imagine sitting down with difficult feelings. It, it can feel like, oh my gosh, if I go into this fear or I go into this anxiety, like I will get lost in there forever and I'll never come out. I'll be overwhelmed and it's just too much. I don't even want to go there because it just might swallow me whole. I think that's a very real experience that I've had that a lot of women that I work with have. If, if I slow down, mm -hmm. I am terrified of what I'm going to find in there. Mm. That's yeah. a real thing because there's, there's a lot that we hold in our body. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, having some tools to be able to meet these difficult emotions is really wise because of that fear. It's a very re real fear. Um, so your question was around resistance to that. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's probably one of the biggest ones is just, it's, it's scary to think about feeling the difficult things. Um, I think something that I just experienced might be helpful in this conversation. I was uh, on a long road trip with my partner going to meet his family for the first time. And it was a very social experience <laughs> meeting new people and talking and having conversations and driving here and there. And usually my limit of peopling, as I call it, is mm, like three or four days. And then I start to, to really need my alone time. And it, I think we were on day number eight <laughs> and I, I just needed to go to bed. I needed to have some of my own time. So I did, I went into the guest room and I could still hear all the talking. There was still light coming in the room and I was overwhelmed. I was exhausted. I was just over it. So I put the one pillow over my head so I couldn't hear so much. And I just let myself cry. And because it was, I was so full, that energy had to go somewhere. I needed somewhere to express it. And I let myself cry to the place where I was kind of hyperventilating almost. And it was, it was kind of intense and it was also very cathartic. Yet I knew based on having done this before, just letting myself feel things that I was going to be okay through it. And that I needed to let that energy out somehow or else it was going to come out as 
maybe being really not kind to people or just shutting down or something. So I really let myself have that deep cry just by myself. Mm. And I felt so much better the next day. Um, But it was big. And I know that before I might have been too afraid to just let myself cry like that. Yet that was the thing that I really needed to just uh, dissipate and diffuse all of that energy that I'd been taking in. Mm -hmm. And I heard someone describe one time that basically we can spend our entire lives uh, not wanting to feel certain emotions. Yet what, if we allow ourselves to feel these emotions, they often move through quickly. As one man said it was, you know, 90 seconds. If you really let yourself go there and you really feel it for 90 seconds, it will often just move through. Interesting. I don't think that's always the case, but I think often it can move through quickly or maybe it's a couple of days or an hour or something. But there's so much resistance that we have to feeling these things yet in the feeling of it that releases it and actually dissipates that and then the grip is no longer there. Yeah, because in my research, um, it's very apparent biochemically and with all the messaging and neural networking that we have going on in fight or flight, when we experience difficult emotions and as they arise, first of all, it's the body's way of saying, you're ready. I'm going to let this come up now because you're ready to take it on. Or it's Mm. something's triggered in your environment where it can't help but express. But actually, um, your body thinks, your brain, your mind brain thinks that you're going to die if you feel it. That mm. there, there will be a part of you that doesn't survive <laughs> this difficult emotion because it's all its job has been to do is to protect you and keep you from feeling those kind of things. So when I love the, just the 90 seconds of even maybe that 90 seconds is just about, I'm not going to die. I have every tool I need. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to fully feel this right now. Um, so it doesn't come out later because I love myself enough to know that if I stuff this, right now while it's here, it will come back bigger. Um, If you have to logically say that to yourself to circumvent whatever's happening in the brain for your survival, then I've seen it just unfold that way more more efficiently. It, It processes more efficiently. I like the word you use, dissipate or dissolve or diffuse, because those mm-hmm. are gentler words, right? Then push through this yeah. block, you know, breathe through this, whatever. Um, okay. I love the deep cry thing you said, because I used to shame myself about that. I thought, oh my gosh, why am I so emotional? Um, it's not clinical depression. It's just, it's just, it's, there are times where you literally have to shut the world away and deeply process, mm-hmm. like just allow yourself to have those heaving sobs and fetal positions and whatever, whether it's in the bathtub or your closet or something, or just get out in nature. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I used to, I used to shame myself about this. Like, why have I not moved past this? Why is this still here? And it's like, well, this is the last vestiges of it. This is, this is the Mm -hmm. malingering. This is now you're ready. You're strong enough. Your body can sense that you have gotten to a certain place in your progression or maturity or what have you in this domain that it's now ready to move out completely. Um, this, these are the things mm-hmm. I have to logically tell myself so I don't shame because there is, there is that, right? That we are taught to spiritually bypass mm-hmm. everything. We're taught to put on the face and look spiritual and look peaceful and um, let things flow. And there are just times where your body's like, in order for you to flow optimally in 99% of the rest of your life, right now, <laughs> we have to do this thing together. <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, a dear friend said to one time that uh, emotions are energy in motion. Yeah. That emotions actually are meant to move and express, not to be held in. They need to be energy in motion so that they can move through. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love it. Well, Jasmine, this has been really enlightening. Is there anything more that you would like to share maybe about um, really listening and tuning into the body and just getting to a space of peace 
about honoring our needs, our personal needs? Yeah, I think one energy that's really helpful to bring to this conversation and this this question about turning towards ourselves is a sense of gentleness and compassion. The kind of energy that we might bring to an infant as we're turning towards ourselves. Can it just be okay that we have needs to begin with? Can it just be okay that you're tired right now and you'd rather go to sleep than do anything else? Instead of, you know, the pushing through and the conforming to what others ask for, all that kind of energy, just more gentleness and compassion towards ourselves, I think will go a long way and just feels good. Even just to say those words feels really good. So if there was, you know, one, one prayer that I could offer to women, it's to just bring that sense of gentleness towards your own self as you explore what it is that you need and how to get those needs met. And to just know that we're all human. We all have needs. They're, they're valuable. They're sacred. They're beautiful. And they're worthy of being met. That's beautiful. That's a great space to end. And I think, you know, when we talk about the cost it's too high. The cost is too high. This is the only body you have. And, you know, to live exhausted and experiencing chronic health issues and fatigue and, and shut down at the cellular level as, a, and all this resentment you talked about, you know, we start resenting the people closest to us because we're projecting onto them what we're not meeting for ourselves. Mm-hmm. How can we meet their needs? Right. And um, there, I have experienced that deep resentment having um, just as a mom and as a businesswoman and, you know, you tend, and it, you know, anyway, so that there's, there's just the cost is too high to not honor this one beautiful body temple we have and to check in and into our sacred chambers inside that queendom within and really just give ourselves the gift of of honoring and nourishing and meeting those personal sacred needs. And I intentionally air this episode um, literally Christmas Day. (laughs) I haven't told you this yet, Jasmine, but um, my podcasts always air on Wednesdays and it happens that Christmas is on a Wednesday. And I just wanted to give people the gift of the the um give themselves the gift rather this 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 beautiful day to many people probably won't even listen to it on christmas but at least giving themselves the gift of that beautiful nurturing nourishing life-giving self-care so thank you for being my mentor in this this is fun our journey's not over we have several more months you and i together um which I've really cherished and loved um, the things that you've brought into my personal space. And now we gift it with everyone else. Mm, So happy to share. And I really appreciate you inviting me into this space with you and and all of your listeners. Yeah. And Merry Early Christmas. (laughs) Mm, Same to you. May it be full of self-care and nourishment. (laughs) Yes. Jasmine has some beautiful free offerings on her website, jasminepatton.com. She's got a couple of free guided meditations that help women reduce stress and overwhelm and tap into your inner wisdom. So go check that out. You can also find her on Instagram, Radiant Alive Woman. Now, again, uh, when we're talking about this beautiful, personal, devotional self-care, it's an act of reverence. It's a gift. Taking care of yourself, you're not just giving yourself a gift. You're giving everyone around you that gift. That's how it works because that nourishment just seeps right out of us and inspires the other people around us. Plus we have all these generated reserves with which to give. Now, I wanted to also mention to you that I'm doing a free masterclass webinar and that's going to be on January 9th. So stay tuned in Women Seeking Wholeness Facebook group because this is going to be a really cool deep dive into 
accessing the vast reserves within you, the empire of content and energy reserves that you literally sit on, these untapped reserves, how you receive so you're better able to give. So I'll be going into my creation compass and all that. So watch for that free masterclass where I go into a lot of these deeper principles around creation. And especially as we move into 2020, this is the year, this is the decade of the woman, the number two, if you hear me talk about the number of feminine wholeness, it is 22, it is two, the master number two, two, but actually we've got two twos coming up this year. And I think this whole decade is gonna be killer for the emergence of the feminine. So check that out on the Women Seeking Wholeness Facebook group as we get moving closer and closer into this beautiful time for you to feel, express, and be who you were created to be. Merry Christmas. Have a lovely holiday season, and we'll see you next Wednesday where I will do a solo episode on January 1st, 2020.